Hey, Eli. Hey, Brandon. How are oh, you? Yeah. Good, good. Did, did you move? Uh, yeah, I did. Like, <laughs> quite a while, actually, <laughs> last year. <laughs> uh, this is the first time I'm seeing a new, a new space. Uh, it's probably my camera been like different. I think my camera been turned usually like that way. Uh, okay. I love the 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 star. Uh, so it says the Star Wars destroyer. Yeah, because I I I I used to use uh, uh my MacBook, but I got like a little camera on my display, so it's easier. Maybe that's why it looks different. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same room when I've been for last yeah. per month i guess okay. um yeah so i'll need like a five minutes for update on that uh on that item okay are, are you is this something that you uh, i know like finney originally created the issue are you working with him or is, is this something that you kind of just picked up no i just picked up i'm working on it because it, i see like um lots of intersection and i've been like talking about that square card from OSSF for a okay. while. Yeah. It seems good. to be like, this is what we need to start with, uh, the easiest one. Yeah, that's, uh, we'll, we'll have uh, some discussion around that. Um, after we cover the main, we have one main topic today, so I'm, I'm, I'm not worried about. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's not like, if, if you have time, uh, I can give an update and ask a few questions, sir. Because I need to figure out where to find the date, some data. OK. Since it's a short one, maybe we'll just do it at the start then. Uh, yep, we can do it this way. All right, everyone, I'm going to paste the link to the meeting notes in the chat. Uh, please go in and put your name down. All right, we'll give it a couple couple of minutes. Andreas, I see the weather is nice out where you are. <laughs> that's right. Oh, that's a new office, man. <laughs> is that the Vega, the Vega Mansion? Is that the the West Wing? Huh? Uh-uh. <laughs> Public space. I wear sunglasses when he takes meetings now. That's how it is, man. I like it. It's a good move. I haven't left this basement about six months, so I don't even know what sun looks like. All right, so a couple of folks drifting in, so we'll, we'll wait a couple more minutes. Okay, so I'm going to paste the link to the meeting notes again. Um, there we go. And let's get started. So 
Um, I see we have a new scribe bot. <laughs> Tim is um, testing a new scribe bot for us. So let's see how that works. Um, so before we start, uh, again, just quick reminder, um, this is under the, the adhering to the code of conduct of uh, CNCF, so the general uh, rules and guidelines apply. Uh, and of course, again, this meeting is recorded and will be published to YouTube later. So today we have uh, one main agenda item. Uh, we'll be going through some of the work that we've done for the cloud native security map, uh, which is a branch of the, the, the cloud native security white paper. Um, but before that, let's go to, um, let's kind of do a check-in. Um, let's see here. So I think we have a couple updates. Um, Tim, are you there? Do you want to talk a little bit about the transcription service that you're testing? Thanks, Brandon. Um, several months back, um, I had heard uh, you guys were, uh, you know, ha having someone take notes and then upload it, and there was a GitHub issue related. How can you simplify that? So uh, I went back into my basement and started to evaluate how can we, you know, enable that. Um, and so I'm now testing something um, that I wanted to then show back and then get feedback on. And so essentially, what it would do is it would do a transcription. It records the video. It allows you to search snippets of the actual transcription. You can see the screen transcription play real time. You can highlight it. And then as you, if you highlight it, then it can pull those highlights leave together. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of like test that out and then see what the value, you know, was. Is it useful to save you guys time and what the use cases were and stuff like that? Oh, this is awesome. I'm, I'm looking cool. at it right now. So oh, it's, it's, are you? Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll flash in a little bit of it and I'll maybe go to the agenda later. Okay, thanks, Brandon. Yeah, awesome. so, you know, I, just testing it out. I vetted it out on some of my own meetings, but uh, I figured you guys uh, have been the first one that kind of raised your hand that said this is something that would be um, helpful because it did a couple of things that my understanding is right. A, it, it may lessen the load on a potential scribe. B, we may, it may, we, we may try to help automate the pushing of it from one place to either YouTube or we already have the recording and then you can just link to it automatically. I need to flush out your workflows for that. And then I, at some point would like to learn a little, little bit more, what, like what's the, why, why you record them, what's the biggest pain around them, what's the biggest benefit you wanna get out for it for your community, stuff like that. So I can get beyond, oh, it's just transcript. I, I wanna get at the, the why, like why, why it matters to you guys. So I can really hone this down. Yeah, I, I think it's gonna, uh, the, the, the main two things is one, like getting someone to, to kind of take some scribe, um, scribing some notes during the meeting. Um, we used to have an issue with getting consistent scribes. Uh, okay. Another one is actually being able to search through and find oh. certain things within like past meetings. Cool. Okay, um, great. Perfect use case. That's what I was thinking. But okay. Yeah. yeah I think so... the, the biggest the biggest value from for me when I go through meetings which I do not attend, it is an easy way to distill what's been happening, what's important, because you can just go through like one hour of recording yeah, sometimes. Long. Yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. All right, Tim, Tim, will it make Andres's jokes funnier? That's the question. Can, do we have that add-on? We we added that to the platform. <laughs> well, you <laughs> just could, if you wanted to fake it, you could highlight it and then say yep. it's funny and then vote on it. I think there's a, a way to do. Does that. it use Comic Sans? That's the question everybody. Oh, no. <laughs> Brandon wanted me to ask. He, he direct the end. Oh, oh, okay. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> Can 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 that I get the use case? The, the real test is we'll we'll be able to parse the gibberish or not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I, I mean, what's... people talking at the same time. Yeah, so actually, that is interesting. We we did test the ability to do speaker identification, uh, and it does it well. Rather than relying on AI, it actually just um, looks at who's physically speaking, 
and then pulls that track and then adds the title. So I think it, it's been pretty good about the overlapping and then um, speaker assignment because it's not trying to use an AI tool. We looked at a bunch of ways to do it with AI. It's just, that's a very hard problem to solve. Let's awesome. run it for GPT-3 to get like really distilled notes of that. Yes, yes. That's another one that I'm looking at to see how do we do the note. The note taking solution on that is is tough, but um, we're thinking maybe if it's people highlight stuff, that might be a way to get something with a little bit higher fidelity. And if you look into the who's, I think it's in the chat, maybe, maybe it's only the admin can see it, but I think when we add them in, uh, it goes to the moderator and then you can see. So in real time, people can actually look at this and if there's something interesting, they could literally highlight the transcript. Okay, yeah, I think I think we have to play around with this. So it's pretty okay. cool though. Cool. Thanks, Sam. All right. Thanks everybody. All right. Um, let's see, no updates. No updates. So I think before we jump to our main agenda item, um, I think Eli wanted to give an update on issue four ninety six. Um, take it away. Sure. Uh, yeah, I've been looking into issue 496 on a GitHub, which is project to create an automated security framework to evaluate CNCF projects. Uh, it seems like from the notes and some offline discussion, there, there is a tool already uh, from open source uh, security foundation called the scorecard, which is basically pull all their required data and do specific checks, this could be extended, but I think it's, at this point, it's pretty comprehensive uh, in compared to what we can build from scratch. So rather than building something, it's better to reuse it. Um, they tried to do run it basically through some number of uh, open source repositories, not CNCF related, just run them. And there is some public data, but it, it hasn't been updated for a while. So my initial thoughts was just to kind of use it and create a pipeline, but to fit a pipeline with the data, I need to get this repositories like CNCF repositories. Uh, any good source of this? Like, does anybody know where to get it? I, I thought maybe to use, I don't know, cloud native security uh, landscape, uh, but I don't know if it has like direct links to repos. Um, yeah, I have, have you um, seen the Linux Foundation security dashboard yet? Uh, yeah, I think I've seen it. I don't remember if it has like links to repositories or it has a links to the project itself. Like I think the one I've seen has like links to projects. So are you looking for something similar to that? Or is that this, I, I think it was something um, a little bit different. A little bit different in terms of the project might have a multiple repositories, right? Uh, so if you want to do this, which we want to include and what would be the source of this data, right? Because if you look into CNCF landscape, there is like hundreds of projects. And if each of them have like few repositories, it's like a few hundred. So I, I thought there might be data already somewhere that's pre-populated. And the same like when you guys working on uh, security related, a landscape. It is also links to projects, but if we can use it as a starting point for getting links to uh, repositories that's matter, then we can include it and I can just basically feed all this data and kind of experiment it with the dashboards with this data, but it's, it's kind of pretty interesting information in there in terms of like, I don't know, 99% of for not signing at all, like nothing and don't care much. So probably can look into this data in future and, and see what we can improve 
and uh, working with CNCF on that. So what I hear is it's like a best practices batch app, but rather than being a self assertion of sure, we signed this thing or we don't sign this thing. It's actually a tool that does automated checks for an, a rubric of security things. Right, right. And yeah, and provide like basically information in terms of if you don't have it, what you can do to enable this mm. using uh, like, let's say GitHub. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. So I think in like the scope of everything uh, an assessment entails, it could help alleviate part of it, but it's not going to be the entire assessment, right? Because the focus of, of the no. audits and assessments we perform are, are less, well, we, we do do a number of checks of, yes, the project follows secure development practices, but it's more about, hey, this are the set of considerations once you deploy this at runtime, depending how you set it up, no software is going to be intrinsically secure. And these are the, the compensating mechanisms or the compensating controls you should enable or the questions you should be asking of how this project interoperates with other things in the ecosystem. It, it does do anything related to audit for sure. So it does specific checks. I can send a link to, to a chat. So you guys can click on it. Uh, but it's basically simple things that you can derive and understand from any GitHub repository. Like has nothing to do with audit. It just like maybe one part of it. Do you follow the best security practices for, uh, for open source that's recommended, right? Uh, so it does one of the things but it gives a pretty good overview in terms of how their projects been run uh, in terms of following these best practices. So it's like, does not require doing manual things. So I, I remember we had a discussion here one day about check for uh, security policy. So like one of the checks implemented by the tool is checking for security policy. What is side inside that policy is completely different. Like this is something that needs to be reviewed by human, but at least you can use it as an easy way to understand whether there is some scene or not. Yeah. Uh, whether that something is make sense, it's much more complex complicated example. implement automatically it, it would be intended? interesting to test of take like the security policy for the project like i presume this is going to look for like a security.md file in the repository and some projects might have it in the governance.md or might have it somewhere mm -hmm. else yeah so it's 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 pretty easy to extend in terms of like what what this tool needs to check like we can easily add like whatever checks they need uh, on top of it but at, at this point i feel what they have is enough for like initial run and understanding where we are and implementing all this automation and kind of have this comprehensive view the only the only question would be like where to get data for this is it like manual still work needs to be done or something that's already exist. So if you ever come across like list of repositories for specific projects, uh, please go to that uh, ticket and put it there and I'll take care of it. Yeah, the, the other challenge of considering we're doing the build packs assessment right now is projects that have a spec and have a runtime implementation. Spiffy is another example. Like you're gonna run this against Spiffy and it's not gonna pass any of the checks because <laughs> it's just standards, right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's why I'm talking about what repositories matter. Like Spiffy itself has like a bunch of projects 
and this project's a matter for for this rather than just spiffy that's can just basically contains a bunch of md files totally yeah it sounds like it can be useful it'd be a matter of well what's the what's how do we amass the activation energy required for either us to introduce it as a soft requirement and assessments uh for the toc to ask during uh sandbox intake or incubation due diligence or something that yeah becomes a mandate at, at a higher level yeah it might be sense yeah also like uh need to collect like from the projects not just like projects usually contains bunch of repositories so maybe cncf need to collect also like what repositories are really matter from this project or not like there could be like tens or 20 or 30 uh under one project but only like five percent of them really matters totally it, it would also be good to to help maintainers understand what is it that they get in return other than just additional friction and, and having to put in this thing in take take six store like it's it's having a lot of traction considering how relatively short time it's been since it, it was open sourced but it solves a real problem a real pain point for how to sign releases so it looks like a new project is onboarded every day because people understand what they get out of six store and the transparency ledger out of Rackor more than well we're we're bringing in more more overhead around checks and policies but it's not really alleviating any of our pain points and it's more for others awesome uh cameron did, did you want to add something I, saw, I i thought i saw you wanting to say something just now no no okay all right. Uh, thanks, Eli. If if you could um kind of uh, maybe put down your ass in the issue, um so that you know those that are not part of this meeting can also right. yeah, makes sense. do that. Uh, and maybe you know probably after we get some feedback, we can also like address it. You know, we can bring this to the TOC, um, see whether they can help with this. Cool um so let me get back to the meeting notes so we have no other updates today so we're gonna go straight ahead to our main agenda item and um thanks alex for helping describe all right so um, today we wanted to give a sneak preview into the work that we've been doing with the cloud native security map. Um, so to get uh, to provide a little bit background um, for those who are not familiar with this project, um, this is based on the, the great work done with the cloud native security white paper. So uh, the idea of the white paper is it gave it was a, a a way to cover the different concepts of cognitive security and to introduce those concepts. Uh, when we were doing the white paper, we intentionally left it um, on a very high level. We didn't want to include any projects. We didn't want to be um, have anything implementation specific. And so one of the things that um, we wanted to do with that is to provide a document that has also um, a bit more of a practitioner's perspective to it. And so th this was initially called the landscape, right? The landscape where we had a bunch of projects, a bunch of categories, um, but we figured out that, you know, having a bunch of categories and having a bunch of projects doesn't, isn't really that helpful. Um, and it's very difficult for someone to go in and figure out what other projects that they need. Uh, to do something. So we started off the cloud native security map. Um, and so, um, where is it? There we go. So this is what we have now. So this, we started this a, a while ago. Um, a little bit was like content creation, but the idea is, you know, we wanted to create a, a website or a resource that people could navigate easily. 
Um, so the idea is this, you have the cloud native security map. Um, and the idea is you could go into like different sections of it to check out, you know, what's relevant to you or you can just go through the document. So the idea is, for example, if you go to distribute and say you go artifacts and images and signing trust and integrity, right? Um, so what we have here is kind of like the general concept. This is from the, um, the, the white paper. But on top of that, um, what's being added to, to this website is one, a list of projects. So the idea is you could link to different projects, which may be relevant, let's say, um, as a practitioner, you say, I want to implement signing trust and integrity. Okay, then now I can take a look at these projects, which are relevant to me. Um, and on top of that, we also have um, these examples that are added um, to kind of illustrate you know, what are the type of controls you wanna, you wanna do, you know, what may be a way that um, you will implement that, right? So for example, we'll sign the image manifest with Docker Content Trust, uh, you wanna attach uh, metadata for the image, such as a uh, S-bomb to it, uh, and then you can make policy decisions on it. Um, so the idea is kind of like more, more, implementation, examples of implementation steps to um, implement a security control. Um, we inten intentionally say up front that it's not a checklist um, because obviously different, um, different organizations have different requirements. Everything's a little bit different, but this is kind of general guide into what, uh, what are some things that you could do. Um, so the initial scope of this really was to, to go one step further to say that, okay, now I'm looking at signing trust and integrity. I am in the distribute stage, right? Technically, whenever I um, perform a task like signing, I also need to perform a verification on the runtime, right? So there is also a section, for example, um, um, it's here where it's something like that Im image trust and content protection, right? The idea is that we would have um, some additional links over here. This is still something that um, not part of the initial prototype, but there would have been links here to say like, okay, if you're implementing signing trust and integrity, what are the, some of the other areas that you may want to consider next or you may want to um, think about when you're implementing this? All right, so um, yeah, the initial goal was to have kind of like a visual map of it, right? So this is an initial prototype where it's kind of here to sidebar. It's a more of a traditional document. Um, so what we are doing now is we are taking all the content that um, the community has worked on and we are putting in it into this website. So, and I'm gonna paste it in here so that everyone can take a look as well. Um, but the idea is, you know, we would populate all these things. We are all, not all the content, this is final. We are still reviewing it and making sure that, you know, the projects we put in there are in kind of projects with a certain um, quality, right? We, we don't want to put, we want to make sure that, you know, some of these projects are not you know, somebody's weekend project, for example, uh, that isn't being maintained at all. Um, so that's what this, what this document is really about. Um, we are still um, developing this. We still need a bit more content. Um, so if you hit this contribute button here, um, you'll see we have a list of contributors here. Um, and there are some of the, some things that we still need help on um, we are still building up the site. So if you're interested in like development, you can put your comment, um, put a comment on this issue. Uh, as you can see, you know, things like highlight the links. <laughs> uh, so the things can still do better on the website. Uh, if not, other than that, we still have some gaps in content that we want to help fill. So the idea, uh, we are looking for projects, examples, and things because you know the, the general concepts are all being taken from the white paper. So the way you can do that 
is, um, and Martin has set this up really nicely for us, is that you can just, all the different topics that you see here actually map onto uh, a markdown file in GitHub, right? So let's say if you hit like code review here, right? So this is part of the website that's being deployed and then you have, um, this is a code review page, right? So if I modify something and add projects here, it would show up um, on the website itself. So for example, if I go back here, hit contribute, let's say I want to add something to, I want to modify a uh, core review page. Maybe add something like GitHub, right? Right, so this is just a quick example. You can just create a PR for this and you can say update code review. Right? So what happens is we will review all the changes that are being done here. And you know, once this is merged in, uh, the bot will pick it up and then it will update the website automatically. Um, okay, so this is, um, the quick update before we the the security man. Any, any comments, questions? We're looking for a lot of feedback on um, what are some things that we can do do better. Right. What are some things that people want to see on the website as well? Hey, Brandon. A quick question, and this may have been answered already. I only just managed to join this meeting from another meeting. Um, uh, we in the project section. Are we only listing out the open source? Uh, projects, not the commercial ones that we put in the original doc. Yeah, so right now you don't see it here, but there's actually an invisible command for commercial projects. Um, we are still evaluating what we want to do with the commercial project. I think that is, is a little bit of a, um, a sensitive topic. Um, yeah, no, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I guess from the sneak perspective is kind of uh, a, a difficult one. I mean, like if we look at that section we're looking at now, right? The sneak CLI is open source, but clearly it's got a service on the back end, right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you know. So I, I think I think um, there 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 will be room probably to have some um, have some projects be commercial in specific cases. I think I was having a conversation with, with uh, Matt uh, Flan, and then he said something like, you know, for availability, for DDoS protection, for example, um, you're not going to find a solution which isn't commercial. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think we, we are still in those discussions. It's, it's not off the table. Um, I think if we think that there is value in it, uh, then we should put it there. I, I think also, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of these concepts also some of them translate to, you know, cloud features, right? So if this is something that's already handled by the cloud, um, the best, the best action forward for a developer would be probably to use the cloud service instead of trying to roll their own service anyway. Um, so yeah, um, Matt, that, that, that is still kind of a topic of discussion right now. Okay. Um, yeah, so we will see where we are on that, but right now we are, we are still, we're gonna put everything over first and then we're gonna figure it out. And then we have to probably talk to the TOC about this as well. Brandon, sounds like the discussion to be had is whether the map is exclusively open source or not, because if it's cloud native, it should be a matter of answering, is this solution cloud native or not? And point it out, we can draw a distinction, put a caveat of, hey, these are commercial solutions that might have some open source or are built around open source. And we can, yes, put like open source solutions first or like add an appendix that well helps people it sheds light of hey this is the software that exists 
that is cloud native, whether it's open source or not. Yeah, I, I think we, we will have like a huge disclaimer somewhere, right? We don't we don't uh, necessarily we're not necessarily saying that these are like the, the go to commercial projects and also like um, the process of which these commercial projects should show up here is by basically whoever wants to come in and add their at the project, right? I think we, we need to have some ground rules around it. As long as we have that, we, we should be um, give enough information for people to make an informed decision. Okay. So, um, yeah, one, one, one added thought there is if, if someone has a problem and they're looking for a solution, they might ask themselves, well, does it matter to me that it's open source or not? Sure, preferably it should be. But if I'm trying to solve for something and I'm not aware that, well, it'd be hard. I, I would have to have lived under a rock not to know that SNCC is, is, is out there and is great. But in case I didn't know, it's like, oh, let me let me go click on this thing and I can consume it as a service. The the Linux Foundation's own scanning stuff is using Sneak in the back end, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think this this is like a problem that also like uh, Linux Foundation um, realizes, right? Right, and that's that's the reason they did the LFX security thing, which is like people don't necessarily have a like smaller organizations don't necessarily have a way to figure out why and how they should handle the risk of open source projects. Right. Yeah. So I mean, I if that is clearly defined, right, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but if it's like basically there are the projects out there from an open source perspective that may handle the situation, but then also here's commercial ones that may handle, you know, those as well. I think it's it's almost like an a la carte menu. You look at it and you choose the one that's going to be the best solution for you. And here's the ones that are kind of on this list. But it's the hard thing is if it's just going to be a set of tools, that, you know, we're not making any. You're back of, to square one again. It, 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 exactly. <laughs> we're not like six security should be the one saying these are the things that we think are the top three or something like that. And I know that's going to be really hard to do. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like a fun fight. Yeah. It sounds like I know, I know that that's that's taking that fight even deeper, but I hear you. But at the end of the day, like if we have a distinction is all I'm saying, open source yeah. projects versus commercial, they have the decision to go either where, where they need to at the end of the day, everybody's happy, I think. But if we don't, if we disclaimer don't have that, it's I, I think it's it's not serving the, 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 the community well. Well, here, here's the other thing when we talk about community, uh, it's largely people who do open source and they're often just heads down maintaining their project. And they might have not used SNCC because they think, well, we might, we don't have the budget for this. Sure, it's, it's a great enterprise product, but we can't afford it ourselves. But mm -hmm. turns out that SNCC yeah. is great for open source projects. And a lot of people don't know that, hey, if, if you're open source, open source, yeah, exactly. So um, this is actually- make people aware of that. Uh, well, what, if, what if it's a scenario beyond the people in the community, but if it's something where somebody is looking at the security map as an entryway in, you know, where, you know, look, a lot of, a lot of people know what cloud native is, right? But there's folks that obviously are trying to get immersed in this how, how, with, this is the entryway in, in, are we, are we saying, you know, we have, are we saying we're only going to limit it to one or the other? That's, that's the thing that I'm kind of like, let's figure well, I, out. Well, I think, that. well, there's an interesting point here about, you know, that there's, there's probably, um, you know, certain, certain aspects of security tooling where there may be a benefit to you paying for something, right? Where there's a deeper, there's a, you know, because it costs, you know, it costs an, a, a, a vendor um, money to actually build up databases and stuff. You know, there's a, probably a class of things like um, scanning Kubernetes YAML, right, for common mistakes, where in some ways the value that you're going to get from 
a, a, a commercial offering in that space is going to be very similar to the value you're going to get from open source offerings in the space, right? Because everybody's going to come up with basically the same the same stuff. But then there's, cool. there are other areas of, of security where you might benefit from someone having a deeper, you know, and I'm not saying this from the sneak perspective. I mean, I'm thinking about things like runtime as well, you know, stuff where there is more, more complicated, you know, um, uh, data involved. Yeah, it does. It does sound like kind of, I think we have to figure out what is the goal of how we want to list a project and really how far we can take it between like how usable it is to, um, you know, um, trying to avoid like the kingmaker um, yeah. kind of situation. Yeah. What, one thing I was going to say is that I think that, that if you're doing, if we do commercial, then we have to be very clear with their criteria because every vendor will want on the list. Yep. Um, they will want to oh, be on totally in as categories as they can be. And so we need to have like clear written criteria so that there's no questions of favoritism or anything like that. And everyone's clear it's like, yes, you're in these categories for these things and here's how you get there. So because otherwise I could see this being like, you know, every single vendor who does cloud native is going to want to be in every single category. And that's just going to reduce the value because then everyone's like, well, everyone's there, everywhere. Yeah, I, I so think we want this gonna... document to be useful yeah. and we need to make sure that we, you know, we have it in a place that like people can look at this and clearly know what are the the things that they have on the on the list here but yeah. i'm sorry ash go ahead no like rory makes a good point like having a clear defined criteria for both the open source as well as the commercial projects make it as transparent as possible so there's no questions about it i think that's something they're going to work on yeah and actively going to be working on that like having a proper gating criteria for both the commercial and the open source so if yeah, yeah. what what so uh... An important thing as well is I think we also need to define the different types of, of users that we need to target. Like as a developer, I can this this definitely helps. But if I'm the architect of a system or I'm InfoSec trying to come up with a compliance strategy around how to uh, how to enable developers to do their work, uh, or uh, if I'm on the operations side in various roles there as well. Like these, these security checks may turn into checkbox. Do you have something there? And there may be a whole set of things that they want, they want to focus on that where the fact that you're using Dependabot or something else, like they don't really care which one you use as long as you use an approved one and they have other things that they want to focus their, their time on. So I, I think we should come up with some with some users that we want to target as part of the as part of the security map. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to cover some of the, the comments in the chat. Uh, I think there's some got questions there as well. Um, Alex was actually asking about what does the CNCF do for their landscape in terms of projects? And I think that's that's actually a good question. <laughs> do we have uh, anyone? They yeah. include everything. Everything? <laughs> OK. Um, it's more like an astral map of the universe than a landscape. Yeah, T Tim, did, did you, you said you were working on some. some yeah, project, right? um, every, this is actually useful and it's good timing because I'm trying to figure out what the roadmap is um, for things that we provide to open source through LFX. And I think in some ways there we can abstract away sort of the decisions around, like, you know, for example, someone mentioned already we use Sneak and we're looking at other commercial, but then we've already done the pre vetting and people won't have the question, oh, will this be expensive because it'll be done through LFX. Um, so what would be helpful for me is as I build the roadmap is to understand, well, what are the problems you want to solve? And then we'll go off and figure out with your guidance, like check out these vendors. And then we're going through with the vendors and asking, okay, we want this available for open source. We want it to, you know, go through our control panel, the LFX project control center. We want to make sure it's still usable for developers. And then someone mentioned, you know, the personas, we want to vet that out. Um, so I think what would be helpful, I, I think is you started to do it a little bit with the examples was sort of like, I started by what's the type of vulnerabilities that people care about that we will then say, okay, we're gonna find what the right tooling is. Uh, um, and then what we can do is we can then abstract away some of that and put it into LFX and then people won't have to go through 
they, they can still use their own choice, but we'll have vetted it out. It'll be easier to instrument based on your projects. The cost will be covered if you're a member of the, if it's part of the Linux Foundation. I mean, all those things, we can kind of take the lift off of the project uh, TSCs. Um, but I don't know the scope of the kinds of um, problems, how far people want to go. Like, for example, I saw here listed was um, SAST, but do people want to consider DAST, but then now you've got to develop the run, be able to run the runtime automatically as part of your CI CD. And, you know, we, we're not able to generalize that completely and not everything has a runtime. And so I sort of paused, oh, do I really want to go down that path? Like, I, I, I think I, I can share my roadmap or I, we can start with one. Like, what are the set of problems you want to solve? Like, I started to look at what was the low hanging fruit. It's like dependency scanning, checking for the vulnerability database of things that are known, secret scanning, like kind of basic, basic stuff. And I'm, I'm trying to get a feel how far this roadmap goes that we want to try to do. I think an interesting place to go to as well is, you know, the infrastructure side, um, you know, being able to run, for example, like CIS benchmarks or like some kind of compliance scans against infrastructure. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's going to be a whole different thing. And then, you know, it's going to open up a lot of costs, as well, which I don't know whether it's <laughs> going to be sustainable to, to manage as well. Yeah. So I think those are the things that we, I want to kind of get a feel for from this group since we're literally talking about it and then things kind of can scan off like I was just meeting with like I guess CNCF uses source graph and I met with the CTO yesterday and we're like it seems like you know someone else would have they wanted a project wouldn't have tighter controls over what security concerns they had rather than just relying on a black box a quasi black box you know vuln database they build their own patterns and we use that. So I think that that's kind of where I would like to, I'd like to, I like to hear it. and I can share, like, these are the problems that I'm thinking yeah. of solving, but th then we can go off and take your suggestions on, you know, do we want to have a way so that OSS fuzz is really easy. You just put in your repo, set it up, and then mm -hmm. it'll run like that, that then, then we can go into your recommendations on, on whether it's open source or commercial. Um, but, but I, I'm at a phase where I'm, literally was working yesterday on what the roadmap of problems we wanted to solve. And I'd love your, your input, how wide or how deep do we need to go? Is it more shallow and what's the most common? Tim, you, you raise a great point. I think framing it at what are the set of problems is yeah. the most useful and making it as scenario driven. Like yeah. as technologists, we're often subject to like marketing myopia. And we forget <laughs> that people don't, don't want the quarter inch drill. They don't care about the features on the drill. They care about a quarter inch hole. Right. So yeah. what are the tools? And yeah, obviously you might want to ask, well, what's the difference between a regular drill and an electrical drill or like a hammer drill, right? Mm -hmm. sure. And depending on the troll, like on the material you're drilling through, you, you might oh, use you one or the other, right? Exactly. So sounds like the decision-making criteria rather than being an exhaustive list of, of all the software that, yeah. that's out there, whether it's open source, it's like, hey, if if this is your risk profile and these are the there requirements you of your organization, right. you should consider software that checks this this list. Exactly. And, and that's what I'd love to hear where, how far we, is the interest. Like you can go through the whole supply chain up to, you know, do people care about the binaries coming from packages? Do they want to have a hash insurance, you know, signature, all the way up to, you know, the the commits. Like, there's so many different ways you could go. Um, I, I'd love to kind of like put that in, and I can either next time share these are the things that I put. You can guys can say, yeah, we don't care about this, or you know, go into supply chain. All we have the packages is not interesting, but we only care about X. You know, that 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 I think would help us frame the scope of the problem. Yeah, I think that's great, Tim. Do, maybe. Um... Do you want to present a little bit yeah. of what you have in one of the sessions? Yeah, sure. I'll try to do it uh, either maybe next week. I mean, I'm literally in the middle of like putting it. It'll be very like half baked because I'm trying to keep the, the funnel open. But maybe this would be a good time for me to actually get it out of my head and in front of experienced practitioners. That would be awesome. Cool. I think that I think that's that's something that we are all going to be excited about. Awesome. Great. Super. I see Dan Pop just dropped and I was ready to deliver a joke. Uh, no, don't, don't make that 
get in your way, man. Bad for him. This is your show. <laughs> this is one I heard from my daughter the other day. Do you know why the computer married the Wi-Fi? Why? They had a good connection. <laughs> Dad jokes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, the describe AI thing, that's, that's a good um, action item, you know, to highlight. So. <laughs> <laughs> I I think it it right. made it made the cut. <laughs> it made the cut. We'll see. Uh, um. All right. So, what I I guess we don't have anything else on today's agenda. Um. How do you want to do a, a shout out on um? Cognitive Security Day, Andrews. How, how's that going? Are we? Um, is registration still open? Is registration still open for Cognitive Security Day? Yeah. Yes, I think there might even be a day of the event. I'm not exactly sure, but <laughs> yeah, it's it's trending up asymptotically. We have a bunch of people signed up, and we have well, great content line, lined up. Most of the recordings are due this week. So I know folks are working on that. I'm working along with Itai on doing the opening and closing on behalf of the program committee. But yeah, pretty much uh, smooth sailing. Awesome. Yeah. KubeCon talks were also due Monday at midnight. So I hope for those presenting, you got your talks in. Awesome. Uh, any other thoughts going around? If not, we can we can close the call. Ten minutes. Okay. Awesome. Hope everyone Thanks, has a good week, and see you next week. Cheers, all. Okay. Yeah.